Well, happy Sabbath, everyone. How many of you are excited to begin school? Are those that are in college, how many of you are excited to begin school next week? Raise your hand. Don't see many hands. There may be two reasons. Either you're not excited or you don't have many college students in the room. Well, I... Oh, they're, all, they're in the other room. Okay. Well, I want to wish you all a happy Sabbath. And for those that are watching online, happy Sabbath to you also. And those that are in the overflow room, we want to uh, wish you all a happy Sabbath. I hope and I pray that the Lord will bless you and that the Lord will keep you. Uh, for those of you who are starting school and for those of you who have not uh, begun school yet, um, we pray that uh, God will give you the wisdom and the knowledge to give you a wonderful year this year as you learn and expand your knowledge and your understanding of not only things that are around, around you, but also concerning Christ and his character. I want to get straight into the message this morning. So uh, if you can, let's just bow our heads for a word of prayer. Father, we thank you once again for the gift of life. Please speak to us this morning. We thank you and we love you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I've entitled today's sermon, The Unpopular Christ. The Unpopular Christ, or if I were to choose a subtitle for today's sermon, it'll go something like this, The Jesus Nobody Wants. The Jesus That Nobody Wants, or The Unpopular Jesus. You see, I've been reading this book about uh, the Jews and what they believe. I've been reading this book about Muslims and what they believe and Hindus. And you know, right across the board, even though Jesus had died 2,000 years ago, Jesus today is still a popular person. Did you know that? I mean, amongst the Jews, Jesus is a popular individual. Even though they don't believe Jesus as being the Messiah, even though they don't believe Jesus as being the Christ, amongst some of these Jews, Jesus is, very, is still a popular individual. I mean, he was a great man that came to heal. Even though we don't believe he's the Son of God, but yet we believe he was a good man. That's what the Jews believe. I mean, he was so good. Listen to this. I'm still trying to reconcile this in my mind. Some Jews believe that he was so good that the Father resurrected him. But he's still not the Son of God. I couldn't figure that one out, but that's what the Jews believe. So even 2,000 years later, Jesus is still popular amongst the Jews. A few months ago, as I was, I forgot which country I was traveling to or which state I was traveling to. Um, for those of you who don't know, I work for It Is Written, and I, and I also teach at Southern Adventist University. And so I had my It Is Written. How many of you heard of It Is Written Christian Television Ministry? Okay, very good. Well, I had, on this particular day, I had my It Is Written shirt. And uh, I came to the counter to check in my luggage, and there was this man behind the counter. And he, noticed my, he notices my It Is Written shirt, and he says, are you a Christian? I say, yeah, I'm a Christian. And he says, what kind of a Christian are you? I says, I'm a Seventh-day Adventist Christian. And uh, he began to ask a little bit about Seventh-day Adventism. And I say, he says, what do Seventh-day Adventists believe? I says, well, we're Christians, but we, we believe that the Sabbath is still the seventh day. We believe that Jesus is the Son of God. We believe that Jesus is coming back to take God's faithful people home. And he began to talk a little bit more and inquire. He says, what else do you believe in terms of lifestyle? Well, I says, well, first of all, we don't believe in eating pork. As, at the moment I said that we don't believe in eating pork, he says, wait a minute, I'm a Muslim. And as, soon as, I, as soon as he said he was a Muslim, automatically my mind tried to find some common ground. And I says, oh yeah, you know, we believe that our body is the temple of God. We don't, we don't drink tea or caffeine, or we shouldn't drink tea or caffeine, amen. And so, um, and so yeah, we, don't, you know, we believe that our bodies are the temple of God. We, we go to church from sunset Friday to sunset Saturday. We also believe in modesty. You know, Muslims, they're very strong on modesty, amen. You know, we believe in modesty too, you know, that our bodies are the temple of God. And so we just really hit it off. And uh, then I asked him the question, I said, what do you believe about Jesus as part of the Muslim faith? He says, guess what he said? Well, Jesus, he's actually a good guy. You know, Jesus is actually one of our prophets. We don't worship him like we worship Allah. But even though Jesus 
is, uh, uh, was a, was, is, not a, uh, is not Allah, you know, we still believe that Jesus is a good guy. So even amongst the Muslim faith, 2,000 years later, Jesus is still a popular individual. Then we come to Hinduism. You talk to a lot of these Eastern mystic religions, Jesus is a great healer. Now, we don't believe him to be God. We don't believe him to be the son of God. But he goes around and heals people. We're all about healing, Eastern mysticism. I mean, Jesus will find himself meditating up in the mountains. So even amongst the Hindus, Jesus seems to be a very popular, a very famous and likable individual. Muslims, Jews, Eastern religion, Hinduism, even amongst Christianity today. Let's come home a little bit closer. Even amongst Christians today, whether you're Baptist, Methodist, Catholic, Jesus is a very popular individual, especially when it comes to Christmas. Can you say amen? We love the Jesus of Christmas. All those cute, cuddly cheeks in the manger. We just love to hug Jesus every Christmas. And we talk about this little baby Jesus being born in a manger, and we just love him so much. We're like, oh, well, that's, that's a cute little Jesus. Poor, little, poor Mary, poor Joseph, you know, couldn't find anywhere else. So they found this little manger, and here this little baby Jesus was born. Cute little Jesus. And when it comes to Christmas, all of Christendom loves Jesus on Christmas Day. It's the election year, believe it or not. And you know what's very interesting in the election year, uh, November the 4th, even in this year, Jesus is still very popular. There's this sign that goes out, it's actually put out by a church in Alabama. They have a ministry. They actually go out and they put this, they actually put this in people's front lawn. Jesus 2020. So even today, over 2,000 years later, Jesus is still a popular individual. And uh, one of the organizers is found as saying this. He says, uh, I think it was a she. She says, people need Jesus with everything that's going on. He's the only one that we can count on. He's the, uh, he's the one that keeps his promises. He's already, what's that word? The, we love Jesus, the winner. That's the Jesus of 2020. Jesus, the winner. And then they continue to say, we feel like Jesus is already the winner and we just want to promote him. This individual says, this is not political at all. It's nonpartisan, non-denomination. In other words, they're simply saying, you know the Jesus we promote? We promote the Jesus that's nonpartisan. We promote the Jesus that's accepted by every single denomination. So even in this year, this election year, Jesus is still popular. Muslims, Hindus, Eastern mysticism, Jews. Jesus is a very popular individual. And then we come further into Christianity. Have you ever got into a bit of a disagreement with someone of a different faith? And then they say, well, Pastor Douglas, that, that, that's what you believe about Jesus. Well, we even categorize Jesus into different denominations. We say, well, that's the, that's the Baptist Jesus, and that's the Methodist Jesus, and, you know, that's, that's the Presbyterian Jesus. I don't really believe what you believe about, seven day, uh, about, about Jesus, but that's, what, that's the Seventh-day Adventist Jesus. Well, I don't know if I'm not sure about you, dear friends, but when I read Scripture, there's only one Jesus. There is no, there is no Catholic Jesus. There is no denomin We've denominized, if there's ever such a word, We've, we've denominized Jesus. But yet the Bible says this is just Jesus, the Jesus of Scripture. And, and if, you've been around, if you've been around Adventism for quite some time, we have two Jesuses in Seventh-day Adventism. Did you know that? We have the Jesus of Adventism that's all about love and grace. And mercy, and, and, and we love that Jesus. This is, this is what I refer to as, as uh, the liberal Jesus. And then on the other side, we have the conservative Jesus, yes or no? 
You know, the, the Jesus that's all about standards and the Jesus that's all about obedience and the Jesus that's all about law and the Jesus that's all about behavior. And then on this side, we have the Jesus. It's all about love and grace and, and, and mercy and the Jesus that just goes around and forgives everybody. This is the Jesus that people preach. They say, you know, we love the Jesus that's all about love. We don't like doctrine. We don't like that Jesus. We just like the Jesus that speaks about love. And then you have this kind of Jesus in Adventism where it's all about doctrine and there's no love in the doctrines. Can you say amen? And you see, dear friends, we have actually reduced, listen, we've actually reduced Jesus to some sort of construction in our own mind. When we further analyze this popular Jesus amongst Jews, amongst Muslims, amongst Hindus, amongst Christianity, you will come to notice, dear friends, that this popular Jesus is a diluted version of Jesus. The problem with Christianity today, and even Adventism, is we have watered down Jesus. We have lessened Jesus we have reduced Jesus to someone who we like. And, and did you know, even in postmodernism today, postmodernism is kind of like what, what, what society teaches today. You know, you get into disagreements with someone, and then they say, well, that's what you believe. And uh, in other words, what they're simply saying, well, that's your Jesus. You have your Jesus, I have my Jesus, and we can all live happily ever after. There is no your Jesus. There is no my Jesus. There is only one Jesus. Can you say Amen. Only one Jesus of Scripture. And so the more we analyze, the more we analyze this, this popular Jesus that seems to be famous in Christianity and outside Christianity, one comes to the conclusion, dear friends, that the Jesus that people love, the Jesus that we have diluted into this good guy that just walks around and loves and forgives everybody, and we just want to hug and worship this Jesus, is a diluted, watered-down version of Jesus. How about the unpopular Jesus? The Jesus that says in the book of Mark, I came to suffer and die. How about that Jesus? We don't want to hear about that Jesus. We want to hear about the Jesus that's all about love and grace. The Jesus that's all about love and mercy. But we don't so much want to hear about the Jesus that says, no, 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 no. I came, listen, I came to bring a sword. We love the Jesus that says, forgive one another. We love the Jesus of the, of the golden rule, right? You've heard of the golden rule? What's the golden rule? Do unto others. Do unto others as that what you would have them do unto you. You see, we love that Jesus. We love the Jesus that says, turn the other cheek. How many have heard of that Jesus? And we say to the pastor, pastor, preach to us about that Jesus that says, turn the other cheek. Preach about that Jesus that says, you know, do unto others as we would have them to do unto us. We love that Jesus. And when the pastor preaches that Jesus, the whole church says, amen. We love that Jesus. But how about the Jesus that predicts dire predictions in the book of Revelation? How about that Jesus? It's the same Jesus. Come with me in your Bibles. Come with me in your Bibles <clears throat> to the book of Job. <clears throat> I want to talk to you this morning about the unpopular Jesus. We've all heard of the popular Jesus. But I want to talk to you about the Jesus that nobody wants. I want to talk about that Jesus. Can I talk about that Jesus? The Jesus that nobody wants. We don't want that Jesus. We want the, we want the Jesus that's just so full of grace. And he, and, and he is full of grace. But he's more than that. Notice what the Bible says in the book of Job. <clears throat> uh, Job chapter 1, all the way in the Old Testament. <clears throat> what book are we on? Job, <clears throat> right before the book of Psalms, 
Job chapter 1 and verse 21. Notice what the Bible says in Job chapter 1 and verse 21. Then the Bible says, And said, Naked I came out of my mother's womb, and naked shall I return thither. The Lord gave, and the Lord takes. Now the King, King James Version here, it says, the Lord gave, and the Lord taketh. Who's the Lord? Who's the Lord? Who is it that gives and takes? Well, Jesus is God. Can you say amen? Here the Bible speaks of Jesus as the one who gives and the one who takes. But what the problem with Christianity and the problem with society today, we love the Jesus that gives, but we don't love the Jesus that takes. We love the Jesus that gives us a job. We love that Jesus. We love the Jesus that gives us money. Can you say amen? We love the Jesus that, takes, that gives us a nice career. We love the Jesus that gives us a nice house. We love the Jesus that gives us a nice car. But how about the Jesus that takes away your job? How about the Jesus that doesn't give you money? How about the Jesus that, that allows you, like Job, to get sick? How about that Jesus? You see, we don't want to hear about that Jesus. We don't want to hear sermons about that Jesus. That's the unpopular Jesus. This is the Jesus that nobody wants. The Jesus that taketh. We love the Jesus that giveth, but we don't want to hear sermons about the Jesus that taketh. But it's the same Jesus. You cannot pick and choose, dear friends. Either you accept Jesus or you don't accept Jesus, but you cannot pick and choose. You know what I call some Christians today? <clears throat> For those of you who don't know, I was born and raised in New Zealand. How many of you have heard of New Zealand? <clears throat> How many of you have been to New Zealand? Shame on you. New Zealand's a beautiful place. <laughs> you know, when I first came to New Zealand, uh, sorry, when I first came from New Zealand uh, to the United States, my cousins <clears throat> took me to a restaurant. Now, we didn't have this in New Zealand, but they, they took me to a restaurant that just blew my mind away. And ever since then, excuse me, <clears throat> Ever since then, I've always loved it. They took me to a buffet restaurant. And as you can see, I love buffets, amen? <clears throat> so they took me to a buffet restaurant. And when I walked into the buffet restaurant, I was like, wow, this, this is good stuff. You know, you, and so, you know, today I, I often see what I call buffet Christians. You know what a buffet Christian is? You have been to a buffet? You know when you go to a buffet, you pick and choose which food you want to eat. And you leave the food that you don't want to eat. You say, I'll have a little bit of rice. Ah, this one here I'm not going to take. But this one, I want to take a little bit of this. Ah, you know, this one, you know, cauliflower, no, no, you know, beans, I'll take a little bit of this. You see, when it comes to buffet, it's a smorgasbord approach. We, we pick and choose the kind of food we put in our plate. If you don't want it, you don't take it. If you do like it, you take it. And so many times in Christianity, we have buffet Christians. We like this verse about Jesus, but we don't like this description about Jesus. Oh, yeah, Jesus, yeah, Jesus full of grace. Yeah, we love that, Jesus. Preach, pastor. That's the kind of sermon I want to hear. Oh, this Jesus, the Jesus that allows, the Jesus that says, all they that live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. Ah, no, 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 no. I don't like the Jesus that allows me to go through trials and persecution. The Jesus that forgives and full of grace, we love, Je amen, amen. We love that, Jesus. But how about the Jesus that nobody wants? The Jesus that gives and the Jesus that takes away. And sometimes, listen, for your own good, 
for your own salvation, he takes away. He'll take away that job. He'll take away that scholarship. He'll take away that career for your own good. He'll take away that salary. We don't want to hear about that, Jesus. That's the Jesus nobody wants. But Jesus is the God, Jesus is the God who knows the end from the beginning, and he knows what you need better than you think what you need. And so he says, for your own good, I'm going to take it away. Jesus, the unpopular Jesus, the Jesus that nobody wants, the Jesus that nobody wants to hear about. We've become, we've become as a society so inundated with this popular Jesus. And he's more than that. He's also a God of judgment. He's also a God that will not only, he not only came to save us from sin, but the Bible says he also will come and destroy sin once and for all. Can you say amen? <clears throat> Matthew, Matthew chapter 10. Let's go to the book of Matthew. <clears throat> Matthew chapter 10. Notice this Jesus Verses 32, Matthew chapter 10, beginning with verse 32. What chapter are we are? <clears throat> Matthew, the 10th chapter. Notice what, notice what verse 30, this is Jesus. We're talking about the Jesus that nobody wants. Notice what it says here. <clears throat> Whosoever therefore shall confess me before men, him will I confess also before my Father which is in heaven. But whosoever shall deny me before men, him will I also deny before my Father which is in heaven. In other words, this Jesus, he's simply saying to you and I, if you come to a point in your Christian experience where you do not confess me, guess what? I won't confess you. We don't want to hear about that, Jesus. If you do not come to a point, in, if you come to a point in your Christian experience where you refuse to confess Jesus as your Lord and Savior, the day will come when Jesus will deny you. That same Jesus in the book of Matthew chapter 7 that says, depart from me, for I never knew you. You know, we often think that Jesus will never reject me. Jesus will never turn his back on me. Jesus will love me even in my disobedience. Jesus will always accept me. Jesus will come to a point where he says, depart from me. I never knew you. Same Jesus that died on the cross. Same Jesus. No different. Same Jesus that fed the 5,000. Same Jesus. We're not talking about a different Jesus here, folks. We're talking about the same Jesus. The same Christ. Notice what the servant of the Lord says here <clears throat> in uh, Prophets and Kings. Notice what the Bi uh, Prophets and Kings here. There's a quote, page 177. Well, let's read it together. <clears throat> Prophets and Kings, 107. One, two. Multitudes have a wrong conception of God. Could that be you? Could that be me? Multitudes, she says, have a wrong conception of God, of Jesus, because Jesus is God. Multitudes have a wrong conception of God and his attributes and are as truly serving a what, friends? A false God, as were the worshippers of Baal. In other words, Ellen White says here, if we have a wrong conception of who Jesus is in our mind, and it's not the Jesus of Scripture, she says we are no different than those who worship Baal. We are no different. 
And so if we, whether we, whether Jesus that believes in conser- whether the conservative Jesus or whether the liberal Jesus, we're still Baal worshippers. There's only one Jesus in Scripture. Only one script, only one Jesus in Scripture. And so this Jesus that's often unpopular is the same Jesus that speaks to the Pharisees. And he says to the Pharisees, ye do err. That's the King James Version. Ye do err. Now, we don't go around using the word err today. How many of you go around saying ye do err? What's another word for err? In other words, in today's vernacular, Jesus, if we were to put it in today's context, Jesus got up in the middle of the sermon or in the middle of Sabbath school class and said, you are wrong. How many of you love that, Jesus? How many of you heard someone stand up in Sabbath school and just rebuke the Sabbath school teacher and say, you're wrong? We're talking about the unpopular Jesus here, the Jesus nobody wants. We don't want that Jesus. We don't want to hear sermons about that kind of Jesus. But that's the Jesus of Scripture. Got up and says, you're wrong. Sit down, you're wrong. That's not what the Scripture teaches. Oh, we don't want to hear about too much about that. We cannot pick and choose. We cannot pick and choose the kind of Jesus. And if we have a wrong conception in our minds of who God is, we are no different than someone who worships Baal, a pagan worshiper. One of Jesus' most startling words is found in the book of Luke. Come with me to the book of Luke, shall we? Luke chapter 14, all in the New Testament. Luke, what chapter are we on? Luke chapter 14. Luke chapter 14, <clears throat> beginning with verse 25. I want to talk to you this morning about the real Jesus. The Jesus that wants to save your soul. The Jesus that wants to bring about change and reformation in your heart. You see, the problem that we have today, dear friends, is we often box Jesus into a little box. We love the Jesus that we come to church every Sabbath and worship. We love the Jesus that gives us all of these great things, but we don't love the Jesus that's, that wants to come into our heart and bring about change and, a change and transformation in our lives. We don't want that Jesus. But that's the Jesus I want to talk to you about this morning. Notice what the Bible says in the book of Luke, chapter uh, 14 and uh, verse 25. Notice these strong but startling words by Jesus. He says here, And there went a great multitude with him, and he turned unto them, and he said, If any man come to me and hate not his father and his mother and wife and children and brethren and sisters, yea, And his own life, what does the Bible say? He cannot be my what? Be my disciple. Now these are pretty strong but startling words. Jesus turns around, he's actually walking, and the Bible says there's a great multitude following behind him. And then he turns to the multitude and he says, listen, if you you don't hate your mother and father more than me, you, you cannot be my disciple. Now why would Jesus speak such strong but startling words. This unpopular Jesus. You see, you've got to remember, dear friends, that amongst the multitudes, <clears throat> there were people who were following Jesus for different reasons. Did you know that? There were some who were following Jesus because they heard of the great miracles that he did. There were some who were following Jesus because they heard that he raised people back to life. There are some who were following Jesus because they were just simply curious. There were some who were following Jesus because they were hungry. And they wanted Jesus to turn, uh, they wanted Jesus to feed them. There were some who were following Jesus because they were sick and they wanted Jesus to heal them. But there was a small remnant amongst that crowd who were following Jesus because he's the Messiah. 
And so Jesus turns around and he says these strong but startling words. Listen, if you don't love your mother and father more than me, you cannot be my disciple. Why did Jesus say those strong words? Because what Jesus was trying to do, he was trying to rock the multitudes down to the core reason of why they were following him. And there were all these people that were part of this great multitude. They were following Jesus for the wrong reason. So that's the reason why Jesus says these strong words. In other words, Jesus was simply saying, look, if you're following me for the wrong reasons, you cannot be my disciple. If you really want to be a follower of Jesus, you've got to make sure that your motives are right. You can do all these great things in church, and praise the Lord, you're doing these great. You can preach a good sermon. You can sing a beautiful song. You can give all the money you can to the church, but if it's for the wrong reason, it has no value in the sight of God. And so Jesus turns around and he says, why are you really following me? Why do you come to church? What made you wake up this morning and come to church? Well, what made you RSVP to church? Huh? What's your motive? Some people come to church because they're single and they're ready to mingle. <laughs> yeah, no, it's true. Some people come to church because of potluck. Some people come to church just out of curiosity. Some people come to church because that's just the way they were born and raised. But Jesus is rocking us to our core theology. He says, look, what's your real motive? And if you don't have the right motive, everything that you do has no value in the sight of God. So why are you here this morning? Why do you eat the way you eat? Why are you vegetarian? Is it for the right motives? Or do you have other ulterior motives? Why do you dress the way you dress? Is it for the right reasons? Or is it for the wrong reason? And so this unpopular Jesus turns and he says, look, if you don't hate your father, if, you, if, if you're following me for the wrong reason, it has no value in the sight of God. And notice what the Bible says. Let's continue here. Notice what the Bible says here. <clears throat> and then he says, if any man, if any man, what does that word say? If any man what, dear friends? If any man what? <clears throat> Come to me. You know, whenever the Bible says if, it implies a choice, yes or no? You know, the Bible says if any man. In other words, if, I, if Jesus would say if, it simply means choice. You see, dear friends, if we want to be followers of Jesus, we've got to choose. God will not force you to follow him. You see, that's the reason why the, the disciples, that's what they wanted to do. They wanted to force Jesus to become king and Messiah. If you really want to be a follower of Jesus, you've got to choose. God will not do for you that which he's left for you to do. God will not force you. You've got to choose. You've got to make a conscious decision to follow Jesus. Notice what the Bible says. If any man come to me. Now I'm reading from the King James Version. Jesus says, if any man come to me. Now what does that imply? Come to me. Now, if I were to say, <clears throat> if I can pick on someone, what's your name? You know? If I were to say, if I were to stand here, if I were to stand here on the stage and I would say, you know, come to me. Let me ask you a question. Who's stationary and who's moving? Who's you know what I mean by station? Who's standing still and who's moving? If I were to say, you know, come to me. Who's moving and who's standing still? Yuna is moving. Can you say amen? And who's standing still? I am. Now Jesus is simply saying, sinner, come to me. Who's moving and who's stationary? You see, when Jesus gives you the power, Jesus gives you the power through his word, 
that word has active power when you move. And in order for Yuna to get to me, guess what must happen? She must leave something. What is she leaving? She's leaving her seat. Can you say amen? See, this is very similar to the prodigal son in the book of Luke chapter 15, when the prodigal son had to leave. Who was moving and who was stationary in the story of the prodigal son? You see, the, the, the prodigal son was moving back to the father, not in his own strength and power. It was by the grace of God. Can you say amen? And so the prodigal son comes to the father. The father doesn't go to the prodigal son, but the prodigal son comes to the father. That's the beginning process of salvation. You must come to Jesus. You must respond to the power of his word, and then you must come to Jesus. Not in your own strength, but through the grace and the power of God. You must come to him. But here's my question. How do we come to Jesus? Jesus says that we must make a choice. We must decide. And after we've made a choice, and a decision to follow Jesus, we come to Jesus, Jesus is stationary, we are moving through his grace and his power towards him. But how? How do we come to Jesus? Come with me to in your Bibles, to the book of Matthew chapter 11 and verse 28. Matthew chapter 11 We're talking here about the Jesus that nobody wants. <clears throat> Matthew chapter 11 and verse 28. Notice what the scripture says here, and it reads, Come unto me, all ye that are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you, and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and ye shall find rest unto your souls. So in the book of Luke, the Bible says you must come to Jesus. You must respond to the power and his grace. And, you, and, and, and whether you like it or not, you, you actually start moving your way towards Jesus. But how? How do we come to Jesus? According to Matthew 11 and verse 28. Now, does the Bible say, come unto me, all ye that have tucked away their life into great perfection, then you come to Jesus? Is that what the Bible says? What does the Bible say? It says, come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you what, friends? Will rest. In other words, if Jesus gives you rest, you know what that implies? That implies you never had rest to begin with. You never had rest to begin with. Jesus gives you rest. In other words, Matthew chapter 11 and verse 28 tells us that when we come to Jesus, there is only one way we can come to Jesus, and that's just as you are. That's the only way. There is no other way that you can come to Jesus but just as you are. No other way. Biblically, there is no other way you can come to Jesus but just as you are. You see, if you want to experience this unpopular Jesus that brings about revival and transformation in your life, there's only one way you can come to him and only one way you can come to him and that's just as you are. No other way. I've met people who've probably said, I have met people who say, well, Pastor Douglas, you don't know me. And you don't know the depths of sins I've fallen into. There is no way I can come to Jesus just as I'm. You don't know how far I have fallen into sin. You don't know the depths of wickedness. You don't know my life. And that may be true. That may be you this morning. You may have fallen far into sin. You're probably wondering to yourself, Pastor, you don't know how far I've fallen. You know, I like what one preacher said. He says, for every one gallon of your sin, God has 50 gallons of grace. There is no sin that God cannot forgive. You come to Jesus just as you are. There is no other way you can come to Jesus but just as you are. Please listen, please listen to what I'm about to say next. Listen very carefully. The moment you think, the moment you think, <clears throat> that you can't come to Jesus, that you have to come, that you've got to keep away from Jesus, 
you will never come to Jesus. The moment you think that you must make things right before you come to Jesus, you will never come to Jesus. Are you with me, dear friends? I'll repeat that one more time. The moment you think that you've got to make things right before you come to Jesus, you will never come to Jesus. Because the Bible says there's only one way you can come to Jesus, and that's just as you are. Only one way. And that's what Satan tries to get you to think. That you've got to get all these things right, then you come to, you will never come to Jesus. Before I took on this role, I was pastoring, <clears throat> and uh, I remember one time I went to visit this, <clears throat> this member who, had, who hadn't been to church in a number of years. His name was on the books, and so I took my head out of with me, and we went to this person's house, and uh, we knocked on the door. He opened the door, and I introduced myself. I said, hello, my name is Douglas. I'm the new pastor, and this is out of so-and-so. We noticed that your name is on the books of the church, but uh, we noticed you haven't been coming to church, and I'm just, I'm just here to let you know that we want you to come back to church. You know, there's a seat waiting for you. Um, God loves you. The church loves you. I don't know what happened that made you leave church, but I want to apologize, but we want you to come back to church. And so this man stood behind his door, and he started talking. He started saying all these negative things that happened to him while he was in church. He says, well, you know, they said this to me about, about my family, and this person said this about me, and, that, and I'm never coming back to church. And it got to a point <clears throat> where I literally almost had to beg the guy to come to church. I says, please, don't let anything hold you back from coming to church. Just come to church. We love you just the way you are. And God loves you just the way you are. And just about he was about to close the door, he says, well, let me think about it. I've got to make things, I've got to make my family right before I come to church. I've got to make my marriage right before I come to church. God bless you, have a great day. As soon as the man closed the door and I, my, me and my head outer, we walked back into the car. I turned to my head outer and I said these following words. I said, this man is not coming back to church. And my head outer says, why? He said, and I said to him, there's only one way you can come to Jesus. That's just as you are. This man thinks that he's going to make all these things right before you've got to come back to God. The moment you think that you've got to get your life right before you come to Jesus, you will never come to Jesus. Because there's only one way you can come to Jesus, and that's just as you are. Can you say amen? So I said to this head, I said, this guy's not coming back unless he comes to the point where he's just got to come to God just as he is. Because that's the only way. That's the only way you can come to him. And so the Bible tells us that when we come to Jesus, just as we are, you know the Bible says that God gives us a gift. Did you know that? The Bible says in the book of Acts chapter 5, verse 31, that when we come to Jesus, God gives us the gift. You know what that gift is? The Bible says God gives us the gift of repentance. Another word for repentance is simply a hatred for sin. Did you know you cannot hate sin in and of your own self? Did you know we love to sin? Nobody said an amen. I'll say amen for you. Amen. You know, naturally in and of our own self, our human flesh, we naturally gravitate to sin. We naturally love sin. We've got to, have, we've got to be given a power outside of us, and that power is called repentance. Repentance is simply a hatred for sin. You cannot hate sin. God has to give you that hatred. And the only way that he can give you that hatred is if you just come to him just as you are. And so when we come to Jesus, Jesus gives us a hatred for sin. And we confess that hatred for sin. And then the Bible says, by faith, we have been saved. After we've gone through that process, the Bible says, by faith. What word did I say? By what? By faith. We have been saved and cleansed. See, this is the way the unpopular Jesus saves us. Then when we come to Jesus, just as we are, let's go back to the book of Luke chapter 14. I want to show you something here as we come to a close. Luke chapter 14, <clears throat> beginning with verse 25. 
That's the coming to Jesus. Notice what happens next. And there went, verse 25, <clears throat> and there went great multitudes with him, and he turned and said to them, If any man come, how? To me. Who's stationary and who's moving? Jesus is stationary and the sinner is moving by the grace and the power of God. Of course, not in their own strength, just like the prodigal son. If any man come to me and hate not his father and mother and wife and children and brethren and sisters, yea, and his own life also, he cannot be my disciple. Notice verse 27. Notice verse 27. And whosoever doth not bear his cross and come after me. And I'm reading from the King James Version. Come after me. Now is there a difference between coming to me and coming after me? Now notice Jesus here saying here. He says, now that you have come to me, I want you to come after me. What does that imply? It implies that Jesus is no longer stationary. Jesus is no longer standing still. What's Jesus doing now? He's moving. Can you say amen? He says, now that you've come to me, I want you to come after me. Now that I've cleansed you, now that I've forgiven you, I want you to follow me. Can you say amen? Now that I've given you my grace, now that I've given you my repentance, now that I've saved you, I want you to obey me. And this is the Jesus that nobody wants. We love the Jesus that says, come to me. We love the Jesus that wants to cleanse us. We love the Jesus that wants to cover us with his righteousness. But after Jesus does that, now he says, now you've got to do what I'm asking you to do. You've got to obey me. You've got to follow me. You've got to give up these relationships. You've got to give up working on Sabbath. You've got to give up a certain of kinds of food. You've got to give up all these things. And then we say, oh, no, we don't want that, Jesus. I just love the coming to you, but I don't want to follow after you. You cannot have it both ways. You cannot be a buffet Christian either you accept all of Jesus or none of Jesus so now that we have come to Jesus now he says I want you to follow me I've been merciful to forgive you I've been merciful to cover you with my righteousness now these are the things I want you to do can you say amen that's the unpopular Jesus. That's the Jesus nobody wants. We love the Jesus that says, come to me. But we don't love the Jesus that says, now you got to come after me. And when we come to Jesus, just as we are, Jesus wants full and complete surrender of your life. He wants everything. What does he want? He wants everything. He wants complete surrender. He wants every single sin confessed and repented to him. Now, suppose one day, since I'm talking to a lot of teenagers and those who are single, ready to mingle, <sighs> suppose one day you get married. You get married, you're walking down the aisle, and... Uh, you're standing up there in the front. <clears throat> You're about to say your vows to Mary. <clears throat> and just as you're about to say your vows to Mary, you say to Mary, Mary, I want to let you know, I love you with all my heart. Now, how many ladies here would love a man to say that to them? Raise your hand. Amen. We have one. We just have one. Yeah, you know, 
I mean, like, I'm not sure about you, but I know most ladies I talk, they want to hear that from their man. Can you say amen? No amen. Okay. <clears throat> Suppose one day you were to come to your mother, and then you would, say to, you would say to Mary, I just want to let you know, I love you with all my heart. Mary, you have my heart. I'm committed to you. I'm dedicated to you. From this day forth, I will love you like no other. As a matter of fact, Mary, Mary, I love you all 364 days of the year. But this one day, this is for Susan next door. But Mary, I love you all 364 days. Mary, I love you with all my heart. I love you, but this one day, Mary, this one day, that's for Susan right here, my high school sweetheart. But you have 364 days. She only has one day. How many of you would still like to get married? Raise your hand. How many of you would like to get married to that kind of a person? Why not? Well, that person can say, but Mary, I love you, Mary. You have 364 days. Susan here only has one day. Come on now, let's be reasonable. 364 days, she has one day. That's, that's just one day. I love you. You see, we dare not do that in our human relationship with each other. But we do it with God every single day. We dare not do it with God. You see, we come to God and we say, God, I love you with all my heart. I give you everything, but this one thing, God, this one thing. No, God, you can't touch this. God, I love you with all my You can have my car. You can have my house. You can have my house. But, but this one, this one. No, no, God, you cannot touch that. You see, we dare not do it on a human level. We dare not do it to our spouses, but yet we treat God the same way. And so when we come to Jesus, and now we come after Jesus, part of following Jesus is giving Jesus everything. Complete surrender. Jesus doesn't want 364 days of your life. Jesus wants all. Jesus wants every single day of your life. Can you say amen? So, but it begins by coming to Jesus just as you are. And when we come to him, then we've got to make the unpopular decision by following him. And that, my dear friends, is where the rubber meets the road from becoming a genuine and a real Christian. Let's have our closing song and then we'll have our final prayer. Please stand together with me as we sing hymn number 322, Nothing Between. Nothing between my soul and the Savior, not of this world's delusive dream. I have renounced all sin, pleasure.
Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we come to you just as we are, for there is no other way we can come to you but just as we are. Lord, help us to accept all of you, and not just part of you, but all of you, dear Lord. The Lord that giveth, and also the Lord that taketh. The Lord of grace and the Lord of judgment. And so, Lord, bless us now as we depart. Even though we may depart from each other, may your Holy Spirit never depart from us. Help us to be ready for your soon coming. In your name we pray. Amen.